Hello everyone and uh, welcome to my presentation, Seven Reasons Why the CMO Needs a License to Kill. And you know we talk about digital transformation and we talk about some of the reasons why the traditional CMO needs to, let's just say, uh, move forward. I'm sure a lot of you have seen some good CMOs, some bad CMOs, some ones that are in transition. But this is really a presentation about why the CMO really needs a, a, a license to kill, to borrow from an old Bond movie line, in order to kind of move forward with the organization because a lot of things have changed and they need to get on board or you need to get on board if you're reporting into a CMO. So you can follow me on Twitter at Mark Fidelman, on YouTube, Fanatics Media, that's where this is going to be sitting, well, one of many, many places anyway, and then on Instagram at Mark Fidelman. So a little bit of my or history about me. Um, you know, the reason why I kind of got into this marketing thing is because I could not get the press to cover the companies I worked for or some of the things that I was doing. So I started writing my own blog and then, you know, uh, Business Insider picked me up and then Forbes picked me up after that. I decided uh, to do a really uh, crazy thing, which is write a book. Uh, and it was published uh, a couple of years ago. It uh, really took a, about a year out of my life. Uh, but I learned a lot along that process. I mean, that, that process was invaluable to me about how I went and interviewed about 100 people at, a t at the time and learned what they were doing. It really set the foundation for what I was going to do and what I have done in the last couple of years. Um, and so for me, I think, uh, you know, what makes me different than 90% of the other people that you might be hearing from is, you know, I'm not just talking about this stuff. We're doing this every single day. We are in the trenches. So for uh, for those of you that are just tuning in right now, you know, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. And where I want to start is, you know, I want to talk about what I'm concerned about, what I'm seeing. And what I'm seeing is that, the, you know, the behavior of, let's just say, about 90% of the marketers out there are still marketing like it's 1998 or 2008 or even 2012, which might seem relatively uh, new to you, but it's not. I mean, a lot has changed in the last three years. Uh, they're, they're still creating stories on old media that isn't relevant or, or soon won't be relevant. There are some industries, you can argue, that still have these, uh, still have customers that are reading the Reader's Digest. There's just not a lot of them around, okay? And you can imagine that, uh, you know, if you were trying to build a yellow page business today when you've got Yelp and Google and some of the other, those other technologies that have kind of replaced the yellow pages to compete with, that would be a very difficult thing to do. Yet we're still people, still seeing people market like it's, you know, the 1990s. And then, you know, for marketers, from their point of view, can you imagine only having the skill set to create yellow page ads and, and not be able to move into, you know, where we are today, which is primarily digital in most cases. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is we're fighting for our customers' attention. You know, James Bond, fighting for it, right? And it's, it's not easy. And, you know, when you're fighting for these things, you, you need to, before you tell me how, how much better your product is, and before you try to grab my attention by using all the new technologies that are out there uh, and telling me why you're better or more efficient as a company or brand, you need to, to grab my attention. And that's increasingly dif uh, difficult, certainly not going to happen in the Yellow Pages or Reader's Digest. And so um, even once you have my attention, you, you really need to try and keep it. And that's the very difficult thing for, for even digital CMOs to do uh, and, and new age marketers that are using these digital technologies. In fact, you need to move really, really fast, which is why I was picking on people that are still marketing like it's even 2012, is that even from 2012, it's evolved. Uh, and and you know, most of the, the best marketers out there, the CMOs, you know, the top 10%, they're looking ahead and they're seeing where everything's going and they're beating everybody else to it, and they're getting abnormal returns because of it. Uh, and that's true uh, in the U.S., and it's especially true over in Europe, where I first gave this presentation. So I implore you to think about your target audience, how they're consuming information today in 2015, and what they're, where they're going to be consuming it 
in 2016, 17, 18. Look into that future. Look into the crystal ball. It does exist. You can see where things are going. It's not that difficult when uh, people are measuring just about everything that consumers are doing these days. And you also want to make sure that you're building relationships on those platforms where consumers are gravitating towards. So another concern that I have is that there's a huge culture shift underway. I mean, let's see what's happening in the world just of social media. Look at Facebook, 1.49 million people, and I think that's going to be even uh, higher since June 2015. It's probably 1.6, 1.7. It's a big number, let's face it. YouTube, uh, way over a billion. The last measurement that I was able to find, reliably anyway, was March 2013. So they're probably up where Facebook is today. Instagram, 400 million users. That's a pretty accurate and recent stat. Twitter, 316 million. You get the point, right? Is that people have moved away from traditional means of getting their information. That's newspapers, that's TV, uh, that's radio. I'm not saying they've totally left those things. TV is still doing fine, especially on-demand TV, and we'll talk about that. But the amount of t attention being spent on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, and Vine is unsurpassed. And the ability for you to jump into those platforms and start participating is second to none. Almost zero cost in getting involved with each of those platforms and building a presence. It's just a lot of time. And then lastly, which I'm not highlighted here, but it's kind of a, an overriding theme because each of these exist on uh, mobile, is mobile, and that, you know, even with B2B, I believe mobile is the future of engagement with your customers. And if you're not on mobile, you're going to lose in the future. I'm sorry, but it's true. So let me start by kind of telling you a story to illustrate this. I was talking to the CMO of a large CPG company about why they needed to hire influencers on YouTube, Instagram, and Pinterest, or invest, you know, big in their own presence there. You know, put up a channel, put some videos up there, not just any videos, but videos that told their story and videos that kind of highlighted who they were as an organization. I showed them all the data, I showed them demographics, I showed them the ability to click through to a landing page, how you could track all that how you can remarket to them once they've landed on the landing page and even if they haven't taken an action how they could you know be remarketed in uh, on on the internet but you know what it, it didn't matter to him he didn't he didn't really care and and the reason I asked him he said well the reason is you know I just my team and I don't really understand these platforms I like how you illustrated it mark I like what you said but it just doesn't make sense to us we're so used to these traditional forms of advertising that, you know, we're just not going to invest right now. Uh, and I just looked at them and I said, you know, that, that's fine that you don't understand YouTube and Pinterest. But let me tell you something. That's, that's where your customers are today. That's where they are. I've done the analysis. I've done the research. And if you're not where your customers are, your competitors are going to be there and they're going to take them away from you kind of a short conversation because I was escorted pretty quickly you know out after you know giving my uh, my little speech but you know what I'm right and he's wrong and if you're not understanding that there's a huge shift going on you know you're going to be in trouble I'm not here to sugarcoat things so kind of the lesson here is is that someone needs to take control of the marketing in these organizations and just get things done and I know, we've all been there. Believe me, I've been there. I've been the head of marketing. and I've still had to fight people in the organization, the CEO, etc., to get people to change, to get everyone on board with change, to get consensus and that a culture shift is happening. Whether it, you know people within the organization like it or not, it's happening. And if those people in the organization can't get on board, you have to start seriously thinking about bringing a new a new team because it's going to happen it already is happening i've showed you the stats already we're still in the early phases of this but it's going to happen and guess what in another four uh, another five years four billion people are coming online in the next five years and how they're how, how is that going to happen well uh three major announcements just recently kind of illustrate this 
Mozilla announced a $25 smartphone, not just a regular phone, but a smartphone. That's as cheap as a standard cell phone. So people around the world are going to be able to afford a smartphone, you know, something like an Apple iPhone or Google Android. Uh, Google's experimental internet balloons um, that are going to be around the planet as soon as next year, and those are Wi-Fi balloons that anyone around the world, as long as they're close to, can get internet access. So that's going to help those 4 billion new people get online. Also, Facebook is going to develop solar-powered internet drones that are able to stay aloft for extended periods because, you know, they're solar and deliver internet to these infrastructure-poor areas. So in terms of culture, education, research, innovation, and communication, the implications of more than doubling the world's internet population are pretty staggering, I think you'd agree. And they not only will be consumers, but they will be creating businesses and creating opportunities for themselves as well. Just a gigantic opportunity, one that all, you know, CMOs, marketers, CEOs, actually it doesn't even matter. Everyone needs to be aware that this is going to happen. So from my perspective, you've got to go all in on digital. And if you're still working in that old analog world, and I know it still works, I know we can find places where analog marketing, traditional marketing, whatever you want to call it, still works and it's and it will for for quite quite some time it's not going away but i'm telling you that the best most uh effective opportunities are on the digital side okay so what's the makeup of the person that can lead this change what do you need to be who who do you need to be as a cmo somebody in marketing uh, maybe even a chief digital officer um, who are those types of people that I believe can get this done? So when I look at it, I look at the person as a transformer in chief. So part marketing, part visionary, part technologist. It's just not the individual that grew up in the Mad Men era that does great marketing, great ad copy. All those things are important, but you need to add to that today in the digital world, somebody that understands technology and understands how to leverage technology especially technologies, at least for me, that involve YouTube uh, and then running campaigns that are what I call integrated campaigns. So that's not just running on YouTube, it's running in all different types of social channels that involve your customers. And also visionary, where it's, where is it going? What do people care about? What do your customers care about, even more importantly? Those things all have to be, or all have to reside in one individual. In fact, Gartner predicts that some 25% of businesses in the next five years, we'll need to have this individual in place in order to be effective. And you know, they, one of the group CMOs at a global financial institution told me, marketing will be digitally led in classical, classical second, he says, and it's gonna require agility, inclusiveness, and the ability to be cross-functional. So this person's really gotta be um, kind of a jack of all trades, at least in terms of getting along with other people, understanding technology and marketing. And, you know, he goes on to say digital is going to become an integral part of, of marketing. And that, you know, they see this transformer in chief might, probably owning the entire brand and customer experience five years from now. So expanding out of their traditional marketing role more into the entire brand customer experience role going forward. So that's, that's an even bigger change than what most marketers are thinking. It's not just about the outside world, it's about how that individual is gonna to have to be shaped in internally and has to be shaped um, you know, uh, personally. And as a marketer, I don't, you know, I don't like how fast things are, are changing either. I kind of really dislike it. You know, I used to uh, master some of these marketing items and then six months later it all changes and we have to rethink the entire strategy, especially when it comes to influencer marketing. I mean, that, that has changed so much. It started on Twitter, and now it's really evolved into, you know, the best results you're going to see are on YouTube and Pinterest, as far as I'm concerned. Not in all cases, but in most cases. And <clears throat> it's, it's just gotten really difficult, especially for traditional marketers that used to just really own print and TV and radio and are struggling to try and figure out how to, to deal with all this new stuff.
But you know, at the end of the day, you really have to care about what is making your customer succeed. How are you going to make your customer succeed? What are their needs, their wants, their pains? So for me, I'd literally do anything legal to make them happy and to make sure that they they get what they they're looking for. And I, I know a lot of marketers aren't willing to do that. They don't want to evolve. They don't want to change. They were experts at the, at the time. Maybe it was 2009 or even uh, 2012, and they're just reluctant to change because change is hard, and it is. But, um, you know, I've, I've really done the analysis in the last couple of years, and I'm convinced that you'll either need to create that infrastructure internally within your organization to become a media company, to have this, what I call this evolved CMO that is evolving with the times, or you're going to spend the money buying it from someone or some other media company like BuzzFeed. I don't really see an in-between. Maybe a hybrid model if you're a small startup. I could see that definitely happening. But I'll put this out there. In the next five years, you're either going to have to become a media company yourself or you're going to spend the money to buy it from somebody else. So I'm pretty confident in that prediction, at least in the next five years. Uh, but we'll see what happens. And, and just finally, to kind of illustrate these changes, you know, I like to bring up a couple of examples. And these are relatively recent. Um, Playboy doesn't have nudes anymore, and MTV doesn't have music. And that's really illustrating life in the digital age. These organizations understand they needed to change. At the heart of what they were, they've had to change because the digital age has required them to change. Yet they've done it. Now, some say... Playboy might be a little too late. We'll find out. But at least they made that determination. And if I were you, I wouldn't want to be late. So if you know you're going to be disrupted, you've got to make that change pretty quickly. So the primary reasons I see traditional marketing folks as being doomed, uh, just to stay within the James Bond theme, is that the, you know, they're going to fail in the future and that's it, pretty obvious to me, but it might not be to you, or, or maybe yet. And I'm trying to sugarcoat this a little bit, but you know, if you look at every social network, at least every major shift from traditional to digital that involves social networks, that'll happen in the last 10 years. Think about it: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Pinterest, uh, all started less than 10 years ago. So that's how fast things are being disrupted. And there's a lot more coming. If you just look on the horizon, if you looked at mobile, and you look at some of the other technologies that are coming right up the pipe here, uh, it's going to get very interesting very quickly. So I'm you know, going to talk about seven reasons why traditional CMOs are in trouble. But I'm also going to tell you about how to deal with that as well. So number one. Democratic digital mediums will rule. Do you know there's still billions spent? I mean, billions spent on TV. And how many of you have ever bought an ad or a product that you saw an ad on TV? I, I would venture to say not many. It's more now for awareness, uh, and it's still a pretty good platform for getting awareness out there. But it's a $90 billion industry, and trying to get anything sold on TV, for me anyway, is like trying to nail jello to a tree. It, it really can't be done at least very well anymore, especially when you compare it to some of the digital platforms that have direct audience engagement. And the targeting, the, the targeting measuring results of TV ads is atrocious. You can't buy a targeted audience of, let's say, moms. Instead, you have to buy a, a target audience that's a good proxy for their target audience by guessing what they actually watch, you know, such as a woman 25 to 54, and then maybe some criteria around household income uh, based on the cost of what you're selling. It's not very targeted at all. And, and I still see marketers standing up, or still standing for this crap, and CS CMOs shouldn't, and, you know, should just walk away from these things. Not in every situation, but in most of these situations. And for me, what's worse is, you know, even when we're watching TV, and I, there's still some great programming out there, uh, especially when you look at Roku and Netflix and all the other uh, on-demand TV that I'm seeing. It's 
you know, a situation where people are still, or if you've got a DVR, you're still fast forwarding through every single commercial. So even when you're producing these commercials, how many of us are fast forwarding through them? I know I am most of the time, unless I'm watching sports and I'm, I'm, I'm watching it live. That might be the last holdout. And my capable is, you know, $100. So, you know, why am I paying to watch some of these commercials? And I think you're going to see, and you're already starting to see, services like Netflix who don't have commercials pop up and giving me on-demand access for a monthly fee. And so, yes, it, there's 90 billion spent on commercials, and the mo majority of us are fast-forwarding through them. So that not that crazy? Why are, we, why are we spending all that money as marketers when we know people are fast-forwarding through those commercials? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and, you know, even with TV, TV is being disrupted. We have data-driven platforms like Netflix. I mean, I put Netflix's, you know, ability to discern who's watching their content up there with Facebook. Not quite, but, you know, they've got a really good read on their audience. And, you know, when you look at the ability to target people, I, I'll bet you Netflix comes out with some kind of an advertising model offline and on, not offline, but uh, off-platform that gives people pretty good access, good, gives marketers pretty good access to their audience and we're, we'll be able to target them in a very unique way. Look for that to, to happen in the next year or so. So when you compare that, even with Netflix, when you compare that to say Facebook who's adopting these TV ad tactics themselves, you know, same kind of model. And as the world has gone mobile, you know, as I've highlighted and there's four billion more people that are going to be coming up on smartphones. Uh, sir, Facebook serves ads in the feed, so it's very tough to miss them. They look like regular news uh, or story updates, so they're very tough to miss. So from my perspective, let me ask you this, where would you rather advertise? A company with the best data in the world, hyper-targeting, uh, with hyper-targeting, or a TV with minimal data? You know, I know which one I would choose. And we've already established that Facebook has better data than anyone else because when you look at what TV has in, in comparison, it's not even close. I mean, with Facebook, you can target down to almost the street level. It's quite incredible what Facebook has been able to assemble. They know what we like. They know what we swipe through. They know, they know a lot about us, believe me. They're not even letting us know everything that they've got on us. TV, not so much. So you as a marketer have to understand that anyone that is stopping us, the consumer, from choosing that movie, the show, the video they want to watch, when we want to watch it, is going to be dead. There's no question about it. And that means the CMO needs to focus on integrating digital into any aspect of marketing that uh, has to do with any of those types of mediums that are giving us on-demand consumer access consumer choice, you have to rejigger your marketing efforts away from those platforms where, be, where we're being force-fed content to platforms that we've got a lot more choice on. And so I'll implore you before that you spend that, ex, that next dollar on advertising, think about how you can get ahead of the curve and spend it on the way things are going to be. You know, use that visionary aspect of your personality or implore your CMO to use you know, some foresight and really start to understand where their customers are going to be. So let's go to number two, driverless cars. Think about what's going on uh, in the world today with cars. They're not driverless yet. You know, Google has some. I know Toyota's experimenting. They're all experimenting, right? But think about the world with driverless cars. That means all billboards and radio are essentially gone. I mean, why? who are the only people listening to radio? It's either some hermit out in the woods somewhere or it's, you know, us as consumers in the car because there's no other form of entertainment that's legal anyway. I know a lot of those kids and millennials are texting. They might sneak in a video or two here, pretty dangerous. But with driverless cars they're going to be able to use their smartphones, their iPads, really anything. I mean, I could see entire entertainment centers being built into the, some of these cars in the future, especially if they're driverless. 
So I see radio mostly gone. So if you're advertising on radio, your days are numbered. Any billboard, why would anyone look at a billboard when you got entertainment on demand at your fingertips in your car? And like I said, cars will be rebuilt to have kind of entertainment as the centerpiece of that experience when they're going from point A to point B. So driverless cars for me are a big game changer for marketers and don't think this is going to happen in 10 years. You know, Tesla's already talking about it happening in the next five. So as marketers, we need to understand and demonstrate um, what is going to happen in the future, that visionary aspect of it. With radio eliminated, on-demand video at our fingertips in the car, we need to prepare as marketers for this inevitability. It's going to happen. And as business people, commuting time will become work time. I mean, you don't think workers or uh, employers are going to figure this out pretty quickly. You know, commute time, the average commute, at least in the USA, from what I remember, is about 52 minutes round trip. And I suspect this is true in other parts of the world. Uh, I can't confirm that. But let's just say I'm pretty confident on average it's 52 minutes in the U.S. That's a lot more work time that we're going to have as employees. So if you're a marketer, think about all that free driving time. How can you take advantage of that going forward? I know this is looking you know, out five to ten years, but this is going to happen increasingly so in this driverless car uh, scenario. Another trend that I'm seeing out there is this smart clothing or specifically and the reason why I'm using smart pants as an example is that Google and Levi's are teaming up to create smart pants of all things. You know, if you look at your clothing today, it's pretty dumb, right? Doesn't talk to you, doesn't tell you if it's wearing out, doesn't tell you if it's getting tight or not. But these smart A or smart ass pants, as I call it, from Levi's and Google are going to tell you when to lose weight. You know, the location may, might even text your cell phone and tell you the location of the nearest gym or the uh, nearest Jamba Juice. It's, it's going to get pretty interesting pretty fast, and this is right around the corner. Uh, Grant Hughes, founder of the software development company Focus Motion, explained the new sensors to us, and he says that, you know, they'll be so thin that wearers won't be able to feel them. They could alert you to weight gain and even scarier recommend you know a few ways to lose weight based on what the pants are feeling or detecting as uh, you finish that last bite from the buffet but inevitably you know smart clothing the goal will be to help us live healthier lives and this is just one example of what marketers need to understand is going to happen and what they're going to need to do to figure out well how, to, how can I be involved in this communication between clothing and consumer. So what it looks like today, um, clothes are pretty dumb. They don't know when to, they don't know when to, to tell you to stop eating. They don't know when they haven't been washed after uh, you know, a few weeks or after they've been worn 15 times and they've got stains all over them. But in the future, it's going to kind of look something like this. All of your clothing, okay, maybe not the bow tie. I threw that one in there. But uh, all of your clothing will be able to talk to your, your uh, cell phone and give you information. And you might be thinking, well, there's no opportunity, or at least no marketing opportunity in clothing for me as a business. But if your business involves fashion, health, or fitness, I think you're going to be wrong. And I think once these technologies, uh, these smart clothing are, are out there, there's going to be many opportunities for uh, marketers to, to take a look at and to see if they can capitalize on. So let me, uh, let me kind of paint a picture overall of what's going to happen just to kind of summarize this particular area. Uh, in the future, you know, you're going to have a, let's just say, a, uh, a shirt that you're wearing and it's a smart shirt. And this shirt is going to be equipped with automated feedback loops. So we put the shirt on, the shirt says it's been worn three times and it hasn't been washed. So we put on another shirt and it tells our smartphone that I need to order a new one quickly as the next wash cycle will ruin it. Uh, and then we'll pull up the, it'll pull up the order form right on their smart form. And it'll ask you to order. It might even give you a coupon, say, hey, right now, you know, if you order it in the next 15 minutes, 
we will give you $15 off, or maybe there's a tool for one special, you get the drift. It will truly kind of prove the old adage, wisdom can be found in the oddest places. All right, and number four, mobile payments. We have to understand that attention is on mobile. Our attention is increasingly going to be on mobile if it isn't already. I mean, there's really, uh, I think, a new uh, doctor's issue that's, that's, uh, that's come out, at least that they're alerting us to, where people are actually hunched over because they, they're looking at their phones too much. And I forgot the, what, what that was called, but the, people's behavior is changing, not just by looking at mobile for their information and, and to be updated, but their whole physiology is changing because of the way that they're using their mobile phones. So it's going to be different. And can we all agree that in five years, we're all going to be paying with our phones? I don't see it any other way. I used to use an, an Apple uh, uh, pay. I use my phone to use Apple Pay today, and this was kind of the process that it went through. You know, I touched the terminal with my phone. It asked me to uh, to pay right then and there, and when I accepted, it just sent me a receipt and emailed it to me. It was almost, I'd say, almost Uber-like. You know, I didn't really have to do anything. I didn't have to sign anything. I just hit my phone to it. Didn't have to pull out a credit card. So you might think that you know, saving time uh, is a precious commodity, and if some nerd has figured out how the potential, what the potential time savings here is across 300 million people four times a day on average paying for something, you know, let me know in an email. But this is the future use case here. It's not the only one. And I've seen companies that are working on applications that will stop you from buying items to giving you advice on what to, what else to buy on your, let's say it's a first date. Uh, and I know a lot of guys out there could use that advice to get a little further in their dating lives. But the point is, once people start using this method to pay, uh, going back to credit cards will be going back to holding hands, to use a dating analogy. And in the future, this is kind of how it's going to work. And, and this isn't the only way, uh, certainly. But the CMO needs to understand that there's a real ground floor opportunity here to build commercial touch points with their consumers. That they now have the opportunity to connect with consumers at the point of sale and that all of the consumer information doesn't have to be given solely to the credit card companies anymore. You can disrupt that as a CMO. They could be building offline e-commerce workflows to match their online e-commerce workflows. So if a customer buys a, let's say, a new TV, you can upsell them with a Roku when they get home just by following this very simple four-step process. But you can imagine it can get pretty interesting uh, in the future by using the intelligence of what people are buying, capturing their email address or their text uh, or their phone number so that you can text them or you can do notifications on an Apple Watch. All this information will be stored on, in the cloud for the company that the product is being bought from. So it, it's, it's, it's a brave new world and it's going to happen pretty quickly. All right, number five, artificial intelligence. If you look at what Alibaba is doing uh, when they're taking on Amazon and Microsoft, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, they are using artificial intelligence to make pretty cool recommendations about the what to buy. And I believe the, the, uh, the name of the, the cloud computing unit of Alibaba is called Alien. And it's, it's launched an artificial intelligence service that claims to be the first in China. And it kind of combines algorithms used by Alibaba with machine and deep learning techniques and presents them in a very single drag and drop interface. So it's very easy for them to kind of take advantage of AI by making it, uh, a, making simplified versions of it for people um, within the Alibaba, Alibaba group. And they're using it to predict user behavior without having to write a single line of code. So not only is artificial intelligence happening, and I go as far to say it's not real artificial intelligence, but it's getting there. Uh, but they're making it easy for people like you and I who have no idea how to code. Uh, they're making it easy for us to use and getting some pretty deep insights just by taking advantage of what they've been able to develop in the software. So how many of you have heard of Watson from IBM? You probably have heard of Watson from their, his or its <laughs> appearance on Jeopardy, where Watson actually beat Ken, and, and if you know who Ken is, he won Jeopardy, I think it was like 55 
uh, shows in a row. It was a huge record at the time. I believe it was six, seven years ago. But Watson beat him, and he beat another guy named Brad, and Brad was another big winner. So what is Watson? Watson's from IBM, and Watson is a machine that learns. Watson isn't a robot. It's what they call, at least IBM calls, a digital intelligence system. Watson can read millions of unstructured documents in seconds. So you ask Watson a question, uh, it can research and look through millions of documents in seconds. Watson isn't just a Jeopardy champion. He's, or it's, I don't know what to call Watson actually, has become a physician's assistant, a chef's assistant, a customer support rep, and in my world, a marketer's assistant on steroids. Watson is very intelligent, and if you look at what the, it's doing today, it's doing marketing profiles, it's creating new recipes. Uh, I've actually tasted one of them. It wasn't bad, completely made by a robot. Uh, it's helping politicians get elected. It's also helping to diagnose patients. So basic artificial intelligence is here now, and, and this is happening. So when you look at what's going to impact your lives in marketing and as a CMO, one of the things you're going to have to fa uh, focus in on and factor into how you're going to be performing as a, a marketer in the future is basic artificial intelligence. And I'm not saying uh, Watson is going to replace you in the workforce. I'm not going to go that far. But it's going to you know, soon replace information workers, some information workers, and especially data miners that are in the business of obtaining information that already exists. So if you're a big data uh, guru, scientist, what have you, I'd say your J's are numbered. Now, you can evolve into something that uh, Watson can't be, which is more creative, but your days are numbered. So that high-paying job you have, you've been put on notice. So by arming marketers, and we're just talking about marketers in this presentation, and let's say even the CIO with Watson, we'll be able to run artificial circles around our analog counterparts. And, you know, the reason why you want to, uh, go the digital route in, as opposed to the analog route, especially with Watson, is that you know Watson really can't help you if you're analog. So another reason to move off of analog. Watson can only help with digital information. It could read things that are analog, but it'll be, have to be fed uh, to Watson uh, through digital means. So how is this going to look in the future? And I like to tell a story about IBM Watson and the steampunk movement. If you haven't heard of steampunk, it's basically look making new technology look old. And a lot of it is, you know, either Renaissance or Wild Wild West, or they're taking uh, time periods and they're applying the look of that time period to relatively new technology. So with uh, IBM Watson and Steampunk, the story behind this is that on Etsy and eBay and even some e-commerce sites, this small but growing movement called steampunk, which again was just old-fashioned fashion, uh, old-fashioned fashion, uh, dressed up uh, to look um, like new fashion accessories or new technology fashion accessories. And at the time, you know, a lot of retailers, this wasn't even on their radar. And what Watson did, but through using artificial intelligence, it went and scoured the internet. And it found that this was a rising trend, and this is something that their uh, retailers should be paying attention to, retailers and wholesalers. So if you were an IBM customer at the time, they would have told you that this movement called steampunk was going to become pretty big, and they should start preparing for it. That's a huge lesson. That's a huge uh, bit, uh, piece of information that if you're in the business of fashion accessories that you'd want to know about so you could plan for and get ahead. And that's just a little kind of taste of what something like an IBM Watson can do for your business. Uh, and that extends well beyond fashion. It's every, it can touch every industry. Imagine knowing in advance by using an artificial intelligence crystal ball to know what your consumers are going to want six months, 12 months, 18 months from now. Today, you're relying on tastemakers and influencers to shape that kind of discussion. But imagine having an IBM Watson as your partner in determining what that's going to be and it's backed up by data not just by feeling that's pretty powerful
So number six, machine to machine Internet of Things. Has everyone heard of the Internet of Things? I'm going to assume that you have, but let me just say it's, you know, uh, in this next phase of development, wireless and machine to machine technologies will help connect globally dispersed machines together and form this, let's just say it's a digital nervous system of the this new digital world. And so if you look at the Internet of Things, that's fine, that's great. This is even deeper. This is where machines are talking to other machines and things are happening automatically without our consent. And one of the first early uses of this uh, are the Nest and the drop, drop Cam. And it's really the start of the real smart home, not the smart home that they talked about 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's the smart home and combining that home with the data of the home, or at least the data of the family living in that, that home. And the general idea of the smart home has you know, now given way to very specific applications for previously, let's just say, dumb things. They're not dumb to you as a family, but you know, they're not being controlled by something that understands what to do with that information. So the whole point of the new smart home is removing steps and automating things that you do every single time you come home or if you're in the home, you're doing on a regular basis. And the whole vision is to, you know, remove those steps that you take every day. And I'll give you an example. You drive near your garage and it opens. You walk in and the temperature inside the house adjusts to something you're more comfortable with because it knows who you are. And, you know, that process, as simple as that sounds, it requires devices that can talk to each other, machines that talk to other machines. It's not you on your smartphone doing that with your finger. It's a machine that recognizes who you are and makes those changes. And so for me, I recommend CMOs need to understand what's going on in that home. And it could be an office. Actually, it, it could be anywhere. And, you know, figure out how they can take advantage of a situation where these devices are talking together without our consent. And I see multiple applications for you know, a situation where machines are talking to other machines and then could make recommendations to us as humans as to what to buy, what to do differently, what needs replacing. Do we need to bring in more, you know, go to the grocery store, get more milk? Do they even need to order milk automatically from Amazon and a drone flies over and drops it in your lap? Whatever it is, marketers need to understand that this is going to happen and it's going to happen in the next five to ten years. Everything is happening sooner rather than later. Remember I talked about how quickly social networks grew and start uh, started to disrupt the traditional industry. Well the same thing's going to happen with this machine to machine Internet of Things and just Internet of Things in general. So my last kind of trend and things that CMOs need to look out for are let's just say it's integration with influencers. A lot of you probably have heard of influencer marketing, especially if you're in marketing. And I'm not talking about someone with a few thousand followers on Twitter. I mean someone that has a lot of followers, hundreds of thousands or millions plus high engagement. And if you're a marketer today and you haven't done influencer marketing, you're really missing out. And Or maybe you tried it early and you tried it on Twitter and it, you know, gave you a little bit of a boost, but it was nowhere near the impact that you thought it was going to be. And I'm here to tell you that's the, that was the maybe the old days, and even then I'd say they were doing it wrong. You know, in, in today's day and age, the real money, where the real ROI is being made on YouTube, Pinterest, maybe Instagram, uh, if you just generally want awareness. And Twitter is just kind of, uh, it's a nice place to go if you want to meet your customers, talk to your customers, learn more about them but it's not the platform of choice for influencer marketing. If you really want to get your message out and you really want to drive leads and, and sales. So today's influencer marketing, let's look at the picture today. An influencer, you know, does something on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's kind of mostly uh, a waste of time in those platforms to smart marketers, you know, especially our organization. We're focused on YouTube. We're focused on Pinterest for a couple of reasons. A, they have large audiences, but B, they stick around for a long time. You know, you post something on Twitter, it's gone in a few minutes. You post something on Instagram, might stay, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on what your feed looks like. 
Uh, yes, it gets more engagement than Twitter for sure. Uh, if you look at Facebook, 16% on average, see whatever you put out there. On YouTube, if you're subscribed to a channel, you're going to get emailed that uh, video. It's also got great SEO value. You know, you look at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, none of that has very good uh, SEO value. So five months, six months down the line, that YouTube video that was done by an influencer is still showing up and still converting. And when you got 30, 40 of those out there, that's really powerful impact and a great testimony to your particular uh, product, especially if they're doing positive product reviews for you. But I really want to talk about what the top marketers are doing in influencer marketing and why it's really disruptive. So in reality, and we talked about the change from traditional to digital, in reality, a major change has already taken place. You may or may not know this. And most of marketers, 90% of them, I think, it's the figure I gave you before, and I stand by that even now, marketing hasn't caught up with it yet. Today, there are people on YouTube, for example, that far exceed the viewership numbers than almost any cable TV program. Blab uh, is another great medium that's come out. It's still in its early days, but you can jump on now and take advantage of it, especially if you want to be those one of those organizations that want to build their own media company um, within your organization. But Blab is a very simple uh, tool to use. It's like Google Hangouts, but it actually works, and it works a lot better. It can instantly turn you or your organization into a talk show. So imagine being able to bring on uh, the top influencers in your industry or your top customers or your top prospective customers, giving them a platform where people are watching this particular channel live. And while they're watching it with you interviewing three other people, you can put little offers or coupons on the right-hand side. So if you're talking about your product or your service, they could be engaging with that coupon or they can be asking you questions about it or they could be doing things um, that are related to uh, consuming information that uh, talks more about your particular product. Like we put up eBooks or we put up links to the YouTube videos that have uh, more um, information about what our, our clients are, are doing. And Blab is completely free. You're, there's no payment for Blab. You could just jump on in about three seconds. You just log in with YouTube. I'm sorry, you log in with Twitter and you're live. You just invite people or people just show up. So Blab, pretty powerful. YouTube, just getting back to that, there are those these influencers on YouTube if you want to pay for uh, media. They can be expensive, but they're far less expensive than creating a TV commercial and, and putting a star or putting a cast together on TV and hoping that it converts somewhere down the line. Whereas in YouTube, you can put calls to action directly in the video or in the comments of the video, and you're leveraging the influence and in the, in the viewership of these superstars on YouTube that say, hey, buy this toothpaste or buy this uh, jacket or buy this uh, beauty product, and they do. It really works. And uh, we've compared it, we've done the analysis the right influencer on YouTube, far more effective than PPC. And as I said earlier, that information, that video sticks, stays around for six or seven months. Unlike PPC, where it's one and done. PPC is kind of like, you know, Twitter advertising. It's, it's gone. You, these YouTube videos stay around for a long time and they convert for a very long time. But you're going to pay for it unless you've built up your own YouTube channel yourself. But for me, if, uh, if I were starting out, I would go to Blab. I think that's a, an easy to use, simple, free platform that's in the beginning of where it's going to be. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be the next YouTube, but it's an easy way to engage with your customers, influencers, partners, what have you, in a medium that draws a lot of eyeballs. And it's, it's video. You can, it's live video, and then you can save the video and post it to your YouTube channel if that's what you want to do. So in the future, I've kind of already alluded to this. There are really, you know, three ways, really two ways that you're going to do it. One is you're going to do it all yourself. You're going to use Blab. You're going to build up a media center that creates content, kind of your own digital marketing uh, arm within your organization. 
And it'll be less cost, but extremely difficult. Uh, having to keep up with all this stuff, I can attest, is challenging. And I'm in the business of doing it, and I'm constantly testing out new platforms, looking for information arbitrage opportunities, or just arbitrage opportunities with uh, influencers so that I can get at a low cost and, and uh, they have huge impact. So the second, and let's call this kind of a hybrid model, um, but I still think you know organizations aren't going to be hybrid. They're going to be all in themselves or they're going to be buying it. But the hybrid model is they're going to pay influencers to do it for them or hire them or bring them on staff to do it for them. Difficulties about you know medium, um, but very effective. You know, that's essentially what we do for our clients is we get influencers to create that content and promote it and distribute it. And we could see from their analytics, previous analytics, that they were previously effective, had high engagement, converted uh, customers, um, the, at least their followers, to our clients' customers, and uh, very effective. The last aspect, I think, of this is you know, you'll either, you'll buy it from big media companies like BuzzFeed. Very expensive, you know, to buy a guaranteed 1 million distribution video on BuzzFeed is about $250,000. But, you know, it's guaranteed, it's, it's done, they will drive that traffic. You've probably heard of BuzzFeed, they drive a lot of traffic. So if they produce a video, it's gonna get the eyeballs. And, Potentially, you'll get a lot more, but they at least guarantee 1 million eyeballs for $250,000, which is kind of a fair price for the right product. So I, I want to start to conclude here. The, there's a problem and a huge opportunity. And, you know, in, in terms of mobile, uh, you know, I look at this. Do you mind if I strap your phone to my forehead so I can pretend you're looking at me when I talk? That is the reality of what we're living in. Certainly, if you look at my situation, I get accused of this all the time. Uh, so that, I believe, is a problem. Um, I don't know how we solve it. I don't know if we ever solve it. And, you know, a statistic I ran across that said that 60% of the time, U.S. citizens will be spending their time in front of some kind of screen, whether it's at work, TV, or at home. And, and that's the future, 60% of the time. So as marketers, we need to understand that. And I don't see anything on the horizon that's going to change that change that at all. Uh, you know, I'm nostalgic for the good old days. I think, you know, my family's nostalgic for the good old days when I wasn't on the phone as much. Uh, but, you know, the new reality is we're going to be on mobile devices. We're going to be in front of screens. We're not going to be using and consuming traditional content. We're going to be uh, consuming digital content. So, you know, I, I implore you, if you're a CMO or if you're in marketing or you're a rising marketer, marketer you've got you've to step it up. So I ask you, you know, who's, who's willing to take that challenge? Who's uncomfortable or uh, thinks about making these changes and gets uncomfortable? Who's willing to take that first step and create a digital vision for your company? Somebody needs to do it. Why not you? So... I just ask you, you know, to make a promise to yourself that take that first step and recognize it's not a sprint. It's not going to happen overnight unless you've got a very innovative CEO or staff around you or executive, or if you're not a CMO, you're reporting into a CMO. But then again, we prob you probably wouldn't be looking at this because these steps would already uh, have been starting to take place. So think of it as a mar uh, marathon, but I, I don't want you to look back one, two, three years from now and say to yourself, I should have listened to that crazy Mark Fidelman. He was right. Um, I'm staking my rep reputation on this. I'm going to be right. This is what's happening. I see it now. I'm that digital consumer two, three years out from, from now, so I'm starting to experience what I believe most consumers will experience in two to three years. So as you know, we conclude and but as we uh, continue with this James Bond theme, um, your mission is to, you know, figure out how to get uh, through this particular change from traditional to digital and uh, to, to not die while trying. And I promise you, if you get through it, it will be a much better situation for you, whether it's 
you know, a promotion or if you're already in the role, it's going to be higher sales. It's going to be recognition. Uh, it's going to be all the things that my clients experiment, experience already, which is success. And I want you to, to take that journey and try it and uh, let me know if I can help along the way. So again, uh, lastly, um, you want to read more about what I'm talking about. I've got a book called Socialize. It's on Amazon, very highly rated. I think it's still at five stars. I do a lot on Forbes. Uh, it's called the Socialized and Mobilized Column on Forbes, where I talk a lot about this in, in more detail. And then the website, fanaticsmedia.com. Go there. If you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. We're happy to answer them. Thank you.